Um, I want to tell two stories today, basically, but they're connected. Uh, one story that I want to talk about is the connection we're finding between payday lending and crime. And the second story I want to talk about is the connection between residential racial segregation and subprime lending and the foreclosure and economic crises that followed. But, but these, two, these two stories are obviously linked by a long history, and by long history I mean literally hundreds of years of history of usury and predatory lending that have long characterized human societies since we had human societies. These issues have flared up a bit in recent years, but I think it's important to understand that predatory lending and the kinds of issues we're reading about in the papers today are not unique to this century or even to this generation. These are long-standing practices, and maybe we're at the time in our country where, actually, where we actually might do something about these issues. That remains to be seen. Uh, so with that, let me get started on my two stories, and I hope I figured this out right. Yes. I want to begin with a rap song, and I, I, I'm not going to perform this, but I will read you the lyrics, and it goes as follows. And the, the title of this is, is Predators. This is from a, a documentary about the financial crisis that was broadcast in 2006, and it reads as follows. If you can't maintain a certain amount, no banker's going to let you have a checking account. So when you've got to cash a check because your kids need to eat, there's a check cashing place about a block up the street. When the money's tight and you don't have to wait, there's a 500% interest rate that you keep rolling over on that payday loan. And if you can't find a freezer, you can rent to own. You got to make those payments where you can't miss one. You can buy it three times over by the time you're done. If you do miss a payment, they will repossess, and when your ice cream melts, it's going to make a mess. Because they're predators, predators that keep devouring more and more. They're predators, predators that keep getting richer by preying on the poor. Um, payday lending, of course, is only one part of what's been referred to as a fringe banking industry consisting of pawn shops, title loan dealers, uh, check cashers, and, and payday lenders. And here is a voicemail message that was left for one customer of a payday lender who was behind in her payments. And let me read you this. The, the slides will become a little less unreadable as we go along. Um, but here's the message. This message is for Desiree. This is your case manager, and I am calling because I am investigating your case, as you well know. I'm not sure if you think this is a game or a joke. I can assure you that it is neither. It is an actual live case, and since I assumed you are a woman of your word, as you told me, and we had an appointment that you failed to keep. As a direct result, I will be moving forward with this case without any regard to you or your circumstances, and that will include contacting the HR department and or your immediate supervisor and getting all the pertinent information that I need so that I can move forward. Again, ma'am, this is not a game or a joke. It's a case. So this is how at least one payday lender deals with efforts to collect payments that are due. Now, payday lending and is in its current form is a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, the, the, the growth of payday lending institutions has been very dramatic in recent years. As of 2008, there were more payday lenders than McDonald's restaurants in the country, uh, and they were charging excessive fees for their services. First, I should say a payday loan is basically a loan that you can get if you walk into a payday lender and you have a job and a checking account, you will write them a check for $500 around that amount They'll give you 400 or 450, 470 dollars in cash, uh, and then you come back in two weeks, and you'll either pay back the loan, in which case they'll give you your check back, or if you don't repay it, they'll they'll just cash your check. So it's a, a fairly substantial interest rate uh, that pay payday lenders get, even if you do repay the first week. But often that's not the case. Um, what uh, the Center for Responsible Lending in, in Durham, North Carolina, has estimated that payday lenders have collected an excess of $4.2 billion annually from borrowers. By excess, they're referring to the fees that are above and beyond the risk that could justify the fees that they, they, that they provide. It's important to know that the payday lending industry itself argues that it's performing a service for 
the rare household that on occasion has a short-term credit crunch, and they take out one loan, they, they deal with their crisis, they pay back the loan, and then they're done. In fact, it's the rare payday lending customer that only takes out one loan. Center Respons Responsible Lending has issued a report in which they found that 60% of the loans made by these institutions went to borrowers who took out 12 or more loans in the previous year. And just a couple months ago, they issued a report finding that 75% of the fees that were paid by the borrowers covered the cost of loans, to, to, the cost to pay for previous loans. So these are folks who were caught in what's been referred to as a death trap. And subsequent research of the business plans of these entities shows that this is, in fact, by design. The idea is to get people in and to catch them in this debt trap and get them borrowing money time and time again to, 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 to repay the fees they've incurred from previous checks. So there's lots of research that shows the people who are using these services are being, are being charged exorbitant fees. And a number of cities and states are starting to take action, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But the question that occurred to us, and I'm working with about three other people on this project, is we suspect that there might be some broader community costs associated with payday lenders. Uh, these are not necessarily the kind of stores you want to have in your community. Uh, and, and one of the, the thoughts that occurred to us is that payday lending might be associated with higher neighborhood crime rates. Uh, and if this is the case, what this would mean is that everybody in the neighborhood where these stores are located would pay a price. If crime is higher, the streets are more dangerous for everybody. Property values don't maintain themselves as well. It's more difficult for businesses to survive. Property tax revenues go down, as do public services. So it's not just the immediate customers of the stores who would be paying a price. And we tried to test this out by doing a case study of Seattle, Washington. Uh, we picked Seattle for a number of reasons. One, it's a fairly representative big city in the United States. You know, it's not New York, it's not LA, but it's more, much more representative of cities. About a third of the population is non-white. And I must admit, the real reason we picked Seattle is because we had access to crime data through one of the people on the research team. And, 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 and being the practical people that we are, that was an important consideration. So the question we asked ourselves is, 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 is why might payday lending lead to increasing crime. And a number of thoughts occurred to us. First of all, payday lenders tend to be open late in the evening, and they're open on weekends, and the evening and weekends. So it occurred to us that the availability of a lot of cash in distressed neighborhoods might be a contributor to crime. I, I should preface that by saying that, that it's clear payday lenders are concentrated in low-income communities, particularly communities that are largely minority in population. In recent years, payday lenders have begun to spring up in working class and even middle class neighborhoods, but they are still highly concentrated in low-income distressed communities. These are communities that have lots of people that have particularly difficult job situations, they're unemployed, they're looking for work, or they're, 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 their work is very, is very fragile. Uh, and these are folks who may become stressed because of their work situation and perhaps inclined to take some action to look for cash that they might not otherwise take if they were in a more stable situation. Uh, the concentration of payday lenders in a community might be an inadvertent signal to some that there is money to be made uh, and not just by the proprietors of the store. Uh, payday lending cash may lubricate the drug trade and other underground economic activities uh, in these communities. Uh, so there are lots of reasons why we thought payday lending might be connected to neighborhood crime. And I was reminded of a routine that Chris Rock did where he talked about ATM machines being open at all hours of the day. And Chris Rock's response was, have you ever taken out $300 at 4 o'clock in the morning for something positive? And we suspect that there's an analogy here for uh, payday lending. So the first thing we did was map out the location of payday lenders in, in Seattle. And what you see on this map, the darker areas on the map are the areas that have the higher uh, violent crime rates in, in Seattle. 
the little X's are where the payday lending stores operate. So you can just see visually from looking at this that, that it appears that, that payday lending stores are in those communities uh, that have relatively higher crime rates. Of course, this is just a visual sort of descriptive data, and we wanted to look in greater depth. So at the risk of getting into some boring technical jargon, which I'll try to keep to a minimum, the basic question we asked ourselves is, is why does vi why do violent and, and property crime rates differ from neighborhood to neighborhood, and what might be the contribution of payday lenders independent of the other factors that we know cause crime? So our dependent variable, the variable we're trying to explain here, is the number of property and violent crimes per thousand people in 2006 and 2007. And the key independent variable that we were interested in is the number of payday lenders in 2005, right before the years that, whose crime rate we're trying to explain. So we're, we're, we're suggesting that where you have more payday lenders, you're going to have higher crime. But we know that there's lots of factors that, that influence crime and cause crime. And these are some of the control variables we looked at. We looked at whether the census tract in question was in the central business district or outside the central business district. We looked at the, the percentage of households that were headed by women, uh, the percent of young males, the prior crime rates in these communities. We looked at residential instability that was measured in, by the, the percent of renters in the neighborhood and the percent of people who had moved in, in the last five years, or I guess since 1995. We developed a disadvantage index, which included factors like the unemployment rate, occupation, which included the percentage in low-wage jobs and the percentage in professional and managerial jobs. We looked at the poverty rate, the percent black, and the percent high school graduates. And we did a regression analysis where we basically, again, the basic question was, does the presence of payday lenders help explain the level of, of crime in the neighborhood after you've taken into consideration the contribution of all these other factors to neighborhood crime. And, and what may be the most unreadable table of all, uh, this shows, uh, this, I, can, I can provide anybody a copy of, of the paper where you'll be able to see this, but the key figures from this table is the connection between payday lenders and violent crime. And basically what this table tells us is that the number of payday lenders is statistically significantly associated with the level of crime even after you take in consideration all those other variables that I mentioned. We also were interested in neighborhood crime, I mean property crime, and we found the same thing. So these are the basic core FBI index crimes that are, that are generated every year. And we found that in fact there is a statistically significant relationship um, between uh, these in the, these measures of crime, uh, or the, the payday lending and the measures of crime. Now, we were also advised that, uh, uh, let me go to, uh, here, here's, here are the basic conclusions sort of written in English. Payday lenders in Seattle are concentrated in the same communities where violent crime and property crime are highest. The relationship remains statistically significant even after accounting for factors that are tr traditionally associated with crime and a couple potential problems, what statisticians refer to as spatial autocorrelation and, and endogeneity, fail to explain this away. I think the most important thing we're, we're, we're saying here is some have suggested that it's not that payday lending leads to higher crime, but it's higher crime neighborhoods that have the potential customers for these stores, so the stores are going to where crime is higher, that the, 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 that the impact is, the, the relationship is the reverse of what we're suggesting. Now, this was suggested to us. We, we had a hard time believing that the people who operate a payday lender would look at a city and say, where is crime the highest? That's where we want to open up our store. Uh, but in case that is happening, we, we did what's called an instrumental variable analysis, and Kevin here will explain that to everybody later. Uh, and, and basically, we found that, in fact, whatever potential effect there may be of crime on payday lending, the, other, the, the relationship still works the other way. Payday lending is still a contributing factor on levels of neighborhood crime, even if after you've taken consideration the reverse, the reverse potential causality. So basically, our, our, our hypothesis was borne out. There is evidence to believe that where 
payday lending stores are concentrated. These are in areas that are more likely to have higher crime, and there is an impact of the presence of those payday lenders on, on neighborhood crime. Again, there are important public costs here, as I mentioned before. The, 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 this means that the cost of payday lenders is far beyond the cost that the borrowers pay when they pay the excessive interest rates for their loans. It means that all the residents, all the businesses, all the nonprofit organizations in these communities, their customers and their clients are all walking, they're all walking more dangerous streets when they come into these communities. It means the property values decline. Homeowners are getting less equity out of the homes that they own. It's more difficult to attract new businesses to these communities. Businesses that are there are going to pay more to, to, to operate in these communities, which means they're going to have to charge their customers more. As property values go down and as businesses leave or new businesses don't come in, it means property tax revenues are going to go down. Cities will have less money to pay for police, fire protection, schools, or whatever else that they pay for. Or they'll have to charge even higher taxes of people in order to retain the level of services. So there are real public or community costs associated with the presence of payday lenders above and beyond the costs that individuals are paying who use these stores. So what can be done about it? It strikes us that there are a number of things that can be done, some of which is already being done in, in some communities. So for example, we recommend that cities and states reestablish the traditional usury cap of 36% interest rates on all loans as 15 states in the District of Columbia have already done. Again, as, as I said before, the annual percentage rate charged on these loans is usually around five or six hundred percent and often more. We're suggesting a 36 percent interest rate ought to be sufficient. We're suggesting that communities should enact zoning laws that would limit the location and the density and the number of payday lenders in a particular community. At least 81 cities, five counties, and 19 states have taken this action. Uh, Congress recently, about two or three years ago, passed a law that prohibited all creditors from charging more than 36 percent to members of the military and families who live in or near military bases. We're suggesting that Congress could pass similar rules that would apply to everybody and not just members of the military. We're suggesting that law enforcement agencies might step up their enforcement in communities that have large numbers of these stores. And finally, we're encouraging the creation of what I refer here as more good choice programs. Good Choice is a title of a program in Richmond, Virginia, where some credit unions and foundations and local banks have gotten together to basically do three things. First, to, to provide counseling to people who are having difficulty dealing with financial issues. And secondly, providing small loans, but stretched out over a longer time frame so that the interest rates are actually lower and making it easier for people to, to repay these loans and in some of these programs building in a, a savings component at the same time. So some of the money that people would be borrowing they would have to put into a savings account that would help them build wealth and equity. So there are market opportunities we think that, that could be exploited uh, in communities that uh, where currently there are substantial payday lenders. Uh, there are a number of directions for future research. I guess no academic worth of salt can do a study without recommending future research they'd like somebody to pay them to do, and we're no different. Uh, this would include additional case studies. We would like to see more, more of this kind of research in more communities. We'd like to see longitudinal studies where this kind of relationship is looked at over time to see, see if there are any trends or patterns that vary over time. We'd like to try to quantify some of these community costs to see what the actual dollar amount is that's associated with the declining property values uh, as a result of the increase of each number of, of, of payday lenders. And we would like to examine what's been referred to as the multiplier leakage, that is money that is leaving these communities as a result of payday lending stores. These stores are rarely owned by local residents. They tend to be owned by people who live outside these communities, and most of them are connected to uh, one of three or four national chains of payday lenders. So this is just another way that money is being drained from already distressed communities. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to just read you the, one of the final paragraphs from our paper that sort of sums up what we think we're finding here. And I'll just read this. 
access to a wide range of financial services on fair and equitable terms has been a major public policy issue and the topic of much social science research in recent years. Payday lenders constitute part of the growing web of fringe bankers that have been concentrated in low-income and disproportionately minority communities, though they have begun to expand into working and middle-class communities as well. The cost to many individual borrowers and families has long been evident, often quantified with some precision. While not understood with the same level of specificity, the broader neighborhood costs are becoming recognized as facts of life in the nation's metropolitan regions. The link between payday lending and neighborhood crime should, in fact, come as no surprise. How we choose to respond to that connection, if we respond at all, remains to be determined. Now, I don't have a good segue here, but I'm going to shift to the second story that I wanted to talk about, which looks at the impact of racial segregation on subprime lending. And I'm shifting from rap music to folk music. Uh, and first, let me ask, is there anybody in the room that's heard the name Phil Oaks? I see one hand that goes up, two, three. It's, it's, it's very depressing how, how, how much smaller the, 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 the positive responses are to this. Phil Oakes was just a wonderful folk singer and protest songwriter in the 1960s. He took his own life, I think, in early 1970, shortly after he worked on Robert F. Kennedy's presidential campaign. But among the many wonderful songs that he wrote, one he published in 1965 was called Love Me, I'm a Liberal. And one of the lines, as you can see from that song, was, I love Puerto Ricans and Negroes as long as they don't move next door. And I think with this line, Phil Oaks captured the tensions and ambiguities that to this day surround our notions of segregation and integration. I mean, just in these two lines, I think Phil Oaks is acknowledging the lip service we pay to the value of integration, while at the same time acknowledging some of the barriers that exist that keep us from having the kind of integrated communities that we sometimes say we would like to have. Uh, and in thinking about the subprime lending crisis that struck about two or three years ago, that actually began much more than that, but which public attention began to be paid to recently, uh, it occurred to us, I was working with uh, Derek Hira at the Comptroller's Office and Rob Renner at HUD on this, it occurred to us that in looking at the subprime lending crisis, there were lots of different people who were blamed. And there's probably some truth to all of this. Uh, many pointed to homeowners who were trying to borrow more money and, and buy a bigger house than they could actually afford. Uh, people pointed to lax underwriters, bankers who were making loans to people that, without even verifying their income in some cases, so-called liar loans. There were greedy investors who were buying mortgage-backed securities who really didn't know what was in the securities, but they didn't care because as long as housing prices kept going up, they were making a lot of money. There were asleep at the wheel regulators. The Federal Reserve could have taken a lot of action to block a lot of these kinds of loans several years ago, and they simply chose not to do so. There were corrupt appraisal and rating agencies that, that made these investments appear to be more attractive than they really were. There were exploitative mortgage bankers that took advantage. There were lots of people and lots of institutions that have been involved in this. And, and you hear these discussions going on to this day when Congress is currently debating what, if anything, to do about financial service reform. But what's missing in this discussion, we think, is the context in which subprime lending took place, and particularly a context shaped by increasing economic inequality, the continuing uneven development of metropolitan areas, and the persisting racial segregation in these areas. Several years ago, in a very different context, Jesse Jackson said that text without context is mere pretext. And I think that's what we're dealing with here. And, 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 and it's our argument that the growth of economic inequality, the uneven development of cities, and racial segregation in general, create a context that enabled this kind of lending activity to flourish. Uh, so the basic research question we asked ourselves is this. Is the intensity of racial segregation at the metropolitan level related to the proportion of high cost loans? Um, and keep in mind, what, what, what we're asking is not, is, we're not asking if the number of racial minorities in a community is a factor or the number of, of, of Hispanics or blacks or Asians, 
We're not asking uh, whether the, the size of, of, of the population matters. We're asking about the distribution. We're asking whether the phenomenon of segregation is a factor. And here's some of the reasons why we think that it might be. Anytime you isolate and segregate a population, particularly a population that is lower income and, and less well connected generally in a lot of ways, you isolate them and separate them from mainstream institutions. And it's conceivable that such folks may be less knowledgeable about how financial institutions operate. It may be that in highly segregated communities, lenders will avoid poor areas and minority areas because of their perception that these must be high risk areas. And by avoiding these neighborhoods, it creates an opportunity for more exploitative, predatory lenders to move in and serve a community that's not being served by, by prime lenders. It also may be the case that for a variety of reasons, highly segregated communities might represent higher risk and therefore these folks might not qualify for prime loans as much as others. But the important point here is, I think, is that, that highly segregated communities make it easier for those lenders who want to, to identify those poor minority communities that they want to target. And we do know that these subprime loans are highly targeted to low income and minority areas, and there's research that shows that this has been by design, that lenders have targeted these areas for their products and so it strikes us as not inconceivable that those areas that are more segregated, it's easier to find these markets and to find these borrowers, and therefore we would expect more of these loans to be in these kinds of communities. Now let me just show you a couple of graphs. Here's a map that shows the concentration of high-priced loans in 2006, and I used 2006 because this is where what the Federal Reserve called high price and many have called subprime loans were this is the peak of subprime lending. By the end of 2006, this market had dried up, as had the market for mortgages generally dried up. So this is where we see these loans concentrated. In the interest of time, we're going to have to move on. This shows, not as well as I would have liked, some comparisons between Little Rock and the United States. Let me just focus on these four bars on the right-hand side for a moment. What this shows us is that um, in low-income communities. Actually, this is interesting because we see that the, the highest concentration of subprime loans in Little Rock was in moderate communities, uh, over, you know, over almost 50 percent of all loans, whereas in high-priced or upper-income communities, only about 13 or 14 percent of all loans were high-priced. So we, what this shows you is the comparison by looking at individual borrowers and looking at neighborhoods. So the, 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 the left hand, the left four bars, shows the pattern nationwide for high-income borrowers and low-income borrowers. The second set of four bars moving to the right shows the difference in Ameri U.S. communities. And here you see the starkest distribution. For the U.S., we see that over 45 or 46 percent of, of low-income communities, the loans were high-priced compared to just about 16 or 17 percent in, in, in high-income. Uh, this shows the, the distribution by race in both Little Rock and in and, 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 and the United States. The three right-hand side, it shows that for African Americans in Little Rock, over 50 percent of borrowers had high-priced loans. In white areas, it was about uh, 15 or 16 percent, and Hispanics were somewhere in between. By the way, these are for conventional home purchase loans, and I'm showing you this data. Uh, and the final graph compares neighborhoods. Uh, again, the two bars on the right-hand side. Predomin in predominantly white neighborhoods in Little Rock, about 20 percent of all loans were, were high-priced. In minority neighborhoods, it was over 50 percent. But again, our primary research interest was not so much in the number of minorities, but rather in how widely they were distributed or, 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 or segregated. And what we have in this table is the five most segregated regions in the United States and the five least segregated. And if you look at the two average rows, for those, the most segregated regions, 32 percent of loans in those areas were high priced compared to just 23 percent in the least segregated areas. Um, 
But again, there's lots of reasons why somebody get, could get a loan. I, we're not suggesting that a banker would look at somebody and say, well, you're black, you're going to get this loan, you're Hispanic, you're going to get that, you're white, you're going to get that. Obviously, lenders usually look at things like income, credit rating, debts, occupation, uh, the type of home you're going to buy, and so forth. Now, not in every case. Again, during the, the real, when things were really going crazy, there were lenders making loans to people who didn't verify anything. But generally, you would expect a lender to look at these kinds of things. So we tried to test this out. So we, we, basically, we, we, we basically asked ourselves, why does the percentage of loans that were high priced vary from one community to the next? And these are the kinds of variables that might explain it. So the first variable you see up there, percent of high cost loans, that's our dependent variable. But lots of things might explain why loans in a given neighborhood were high priced or low priced. It might have something to do with the poverty rate in the community, the unemployment rate. It could have something to do with the minority population. It could have something to do with the median value of owner-occupied dwellings. The second bullet on the right is the percent with a low credit score. Obviously, your credit score has something to do with, uh, with whether or not you get a high priced loan. And education level might have something to do with it. The two variables we were most interested in are at the bottom of the left hand there side there were for black segregation and Hispanic segregation. And what we found, these are the variables that were statistically significantly associated with the level of subprime lending. Education and credit score were, were the, the most powerful predictors, but we see at the bottom, towards the bottom, black segregation and Hispanic segregation were significantly associated with the level of subprime lending. In the interest of time, I, 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 let me s simply say that even after you've taken consideration all those other variables that I mentioned, the level of black-white segregation and the level of Hispanic-white segregation is a meaningful, statistically significant predictor of the level of subprime lending in America's metropolitan areas. So the three basic conclusions are this. The concentration of minorities is associated with a proportion of high-cost loans. The association of black segregation, high cost loans is stronger than Hispanic segregation, and higher education and higher credit scores are important protective factors against high cost loans. Let me say a few things, in the interest of time, we'll go on beyond the limitations of our research, since of course there are very few of those. Uh, what do we do about all this? There's lots of discussion in the paper. Right now the Senate is going through this debate as to you know, what kind of financial service reform bill it's going to pass. We argue that, that in addition to looking at lending and financial regulation, if segregation is a contributor to this problem, then part of the solution is taking actions that will reduce levels of residential racial segregation in the United States. And here we have a number of proposals. Uh, I don't have time to go into them in any depth, but one proposal is the Housing Fairness Act of 2009, which would substantially increase funding for private uh, fair housing advocacy groups and would increase funding for pair testing. Pair testing is a tool where, where fair housing groups would send out a white and a non-white couple to the same housing provider, assign them the same characteristics, and inquire about the same housing unit. Because these two people, these two families, are the same in every way in terms of their income, occupation, housing choice, the assumption is that they should be treated the same. And if they're not treated the same, since the only difference between them is their race, that raises the, the speculation that the racial discrimination might be going on. Fair housing groups have used this technique for, for, for decades now, and routinely they find evidence of discrimination in about 20% of all the tests that they do. This law would substantially increase the money available for testing. I mentioned the low-income housing tax credit. This is a, 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 a subsidy to developers of low-income housing. We recommend that more of this housing be built in white areas rather than non-white areas as a way to incentivize integration. Uh, we advocate more inclusionary zoning. There are literally hundreds of communities in the United States today that require developers who are receiving any kind of public assistance to set aside a share of those homes that are going to be built to people whose incomes are below certain levels. Uh, this provides economic diversity in those communities and helps contribute to racial diversity. Uh, and I say affirmatively further fair housing. Under the Community Development Block Grant, Block Grant Program, 
Any recipient of these funds are required to take steps to affirmatively further fair housing. Most don't, and this is a real problem. But we're arguing that the obligation to affirmatively further fair housing should go beyond the CDBG program. It should apply to any developer or any, any, any entity that is doing housing-related work. So this would include recipients of TARP money, uh, financial institutions that benefit from the Fed's discount window, or the recipients of any federal financial assistance. Uh, to assure fair access to credit, we argue that the, C the Community Reinvestment Act should be updated. The CRA was basically a federal law that prohibited redlining that was passed in 1977. Unfortunately, it only applied to banks and savings and loans. These were the institutions which back in 1977 were making the overwhelming majority of mortgage loans. Today, most mortgage loans are being made by other types of entities, independent bankers and brokers, non-depositories, and these are the entities who are making most of the problematic subprime loans. The, the Community Reinvestment Act currently does not apply to those. The Modernization Act would expand the CRA to apply to those, those lenders and would require them to be responsive to the legitimate credit needs of all people in, in their community. The CRA would, Modernization Act would, would actually accomplish a number of other actions to increase fair access to credit, uh, and we can talk about these later if, if we have time in the Q&A. And finally, we, we recommend the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Agency that has been debated. Uh, the, the version of the Consumer Financial Protection Agency that is currently included in the Senate bill is a dramatically watered-down version of what Obama initially proposed. And, and, and the version that passed the House is weaker than what Obama had proposed, but it's a little better what, than what the Senate's currently committed. This agency would be an agency independent of all the other banking regulators, and it would have the responsibility to write and enforce rules governing mortgage lending. So it would prohibit or limit uh, lenders from making certain types of loans that got into so much trouble uh, in, in recent years. Um, but there's also le legislation that would actually prohibit the kind of mortgage loans that, uh, that have been uh, problematic. One of the provisions of this particular statute would create a duty of care. In other words, the lender would be obligated to recommend products that are in the financial interests of the borrower. Uh, and one other dimension of this bill, I, it, uh, I don't know what I just did there, but okay. Uh, um, you see where it says assignee liability. The, 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 the point here is that anybody who's involved in a mortgage loan would have to retain some interest in that investment if they sold it to somebody else. The problem today, and I meant to, to, to cover this earlier, the problem today is somebody originates a loan. They, 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 they give you a loan even though they don't document your income, but they don't care because they get the fee for originating the loan and then they sell it to somebody else who then packages as, as, as a part of a mortgage-backed security and they sell it to somebody else. And as long as housing prices keep going up, everybody comes out okay. But when prices start to go down, all these investments go sour. And the argument is that if you require all these institutions that are involved in this chain of events to have what's called skin in the game, to retain some of this investment, they will be more careful in what they buy and sell and will reduce dramatically the amount of, 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 of problematic lending. A uh, couple points on too big to fail. One of the, well, most of what I've been talking about up till now has to do with how lending is done and, and how lenders behave. But there's increasing discussion that maybe we need to do something to dramatically just change the structure of banks. That we need to get out of the situation where we are, we, where we're vulnerable to institutions because they are so large. So some people like Paul Volcker have said we need to simply break up the larger banks. And in yesterday's New York Times on the front page, there was a story about many Republican members of Congress who are increasingly attracted to the notion that we just need to break up some of these institutions. Others have suggested we need to reinstate Glass-Steagall, which was a post-depression law that limited the kinds of activities that banks could get involved in so they weren't taking risks with depositors' money. Um, one of the provisions of Glass-Steagall was to separate investment banking from, from, from commercial banking, and some have proposed that we reintroduce that. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz and others have, have argued that what we need to do is, cr is utilize traditional tools to basically let failing institutions die. 
the lenders are going under. We need to use the bankruptcy and other tools to let them die, and, but to do so in a way that doesn't threaten the entire financial service industry. Part of the legislation that's being debated now calls for the creation of a fund financed by lenders themselves that would pay for the cost of future bank failures and future bailouts. The assumption is there probably will be a problem sometime in the future. The question is who, who's going to pay for it, the taxpayer or the lenders themselves? And this is a way of trying to protect the taxpayers from having to pay these costs. So there are a number of proposals that are being discussed today, and we may have a bill within the week, uh, and, and we may have nothing. Uh, but the idea, the basic idea here is to limit the threat that any individual financial institution makes to the system, to keep them from getting so large so that they're financially and politically able to control what goes on. The problem isn't just the size of the bank because they have a lot of money. The problem is they then come to Capitol Hill with their lobbyists and they write the banking regulations for us. Um, there is a concern that, that we need to increase uh, we should increase their capital and liquidity requirements so they have reserves to take care of, 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 of any, any uh, financial shortfall. That we need to restrain the activities that are involved and we need to have some oversight over what they pay their executives uh, and we need to take steps to protect taxpayers. All this stuff is up for grabs. None of this may happen. And here's an almost irrelevant table that I found two days before coming down here that I thought was interesting. It shows what John Stump, the head of Wells Fargo, made in 2009. He made $21 million. Uh, it would take the President of the United States 53 years to make this amount of money. The President of the AFL would have to work 78 years to make this. The average U.S. worker would have to work 665 years. And the typical graduate student would probably have to work for about 3,000 years to, 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 to make this kind of money. So let me just conclude with a couple of observations. Lots of people have great ideas, but as important as it is to have ideas as to what should be done, we need to come up with strategies that will actually get these ideas implemented. It's rare that a bunch of smart people sit around a room and say, gee, we need to act in the public interest and do X instead of Y. And I would argue that if you look at the history of redlining and racial discrimination in banking and housing and across the board, Significant change happens when there are social movements organized by grassroots community organizations that put pressure on lenders and lending regulators and elected officials to do the right thing. And the groups that have been successful in dealing with redlining in the past are groups like the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, the National Fair Housing Alliance, the Center for Community Change, and yes, groups like ACORN that have recently gone out of business. ACORN, of course, was started, I believe, here in Little Rock in Arkansas. Uh, they have been one of the most effective entities in representing the interests of low-income families, particularly people of color. And in the absence of a reinvigorated social movement that goes beyond the housing and fair housing groups, that brings in foundations, churches, labor unions, sympathetic corporations, uh, sympathetic academics, uh, and, and, and elected officials, uh, we probably aren't going to get very far. I clearly don't have a blueprint here. I'm simply suggesting that we need to spend as much time thinking about strategies as we do thinking about programs. There was a lawsuit against Wells Fargo Bank in, in Baltimore for racially discriminatory subprime lending. One of the pieces of evidence was a series of emails where loans to blacks were referred to ghetto loans for mud people. It doesn't seem to me it's much of a stretch to suggest maybe race had something to do with what was going on in those entities. Uh, and I will conclude with a couple of my favorite quotes. One is by Lawrence Lindsay, a former member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve and economic policy advisor to George Bush I. And I'll read this to you. He says, there are two faces of community development, noisy protest and quiet accomplishment. One can act one way at age 20, another at age 40. It is called growing up. The protest banner can still be held reverently in our box of mementos along with the love beads and peace signs. This is Larry Lindsay, and it is patronizing, demeaning, condescending best. But I think substantively, he's off the mark. I would refer you to something that Frederick Douglass said about 160 years ago when he concluded, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. And with that, I hope I haven't left time for too many difficult questions. <laughs> We do.
do have time for some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Right here. One sec. Here comes the mic. You, you mentioned that the payday loan industry is organized around national chains. Do you have any information who owns those chains? You know, I'm my answer is yes and no. Uh, there is some information that's public, and if you go to the website of the Center for Responsible Lending, I think you can get a lot of information. One I think is called ACE something, and, and in the paper that we've got, we've identified three or four of the national chains. So yeah, there is some public information, but, but I, I can't tell you how much information is available. experienced, um, or I have in my neighborhood, which is uh, a very heterogeneous neighborhood, racially, socially, economically, prices of houses, you know, all this stuff, and I just wonder if you had any experience with this. We, uh, in order for people to get an acceptable appraisal for a bank or for a lending institution, they will only let you go in their immediate neighborhood. If you have, if you're in a modern suburbia with high-priced houses and every house is just alike, they will let you choose from a very broad area. I, I'm sorry, I miss him. Who, who is they? Who's the, letting the, you the do The lending that? institution, the requirements that they have on appraisals, they now choose the appraisal. Yeah. And they will only allow the appraiser to use the immediate, say, um, for instance, a mile. And if you're in a very racially, heterogeneously mixed neighborhood, you know, you have high-priced houses, you have low-priced houses, you have, you know, it's hard to find, in other words, it's hard to find comparables. Right. Whereas if you're in modern suburbia where everybody looks alike and all the houses look alike, they'll let you go any distance. Yeah, I think the issue here is I would be less concerned about the distance they have to go, although obviously the further the distance, all else being equal, the less comparable, because as we know, location, location, location is what matters. But I think that, that, that part of the problem is, is, is these folks are generally, they simply aren't familiar with diverse urban communities, so they don't know how to appraise those properties. Um, but I would, I, would rather see, I would rather see pressure put on them to identify what are in fact good comparable properties rather than place some kind of arbitrary distinction that says you can only go you know, such and such a distance from them. Uh, the, that, but, but the problem is I think there's less of an effort, there's less of an effort to find those comparable properties and it's, and it's easier, therefore it lends itself to, to less valid appraisal and easier rejections when you can't easily find the comparable property. So I don't know if that's responsive. Are there any, are there any solutions that seem to be the best way to handle all these upside down loans? Well, I don't think there's one silver bullet that handles them. I know there have been a number of re efforts, the, the, the Making Home Affordable program and the update of that. It, it, you know, I, I do think it's important that we're at least now paying attention to the borrower and not simply looking to bail out the banks, which was what TARP basically did. The initial approach was to stabilize financial institutions and not worry about the borrowers. Uh, I, I think I can only tell you what you probably already know. I think we need to figure out a way to more quickly make help available to those lenders who are in trouble and who, with a little bit of help, can get back on their feet. It doesn't help to refinance somebody who, you, who is likely to only redefault in three months or six months. You just add to the costs, and you add to that family's misery. Um, but the, the stories you, you just read about in the paper about lenders, who you, people who are calling these services time and time again, they're having their paperwork lost, it, it's clearly that there's an inefficiency problem there. And, and there's also the, the, the problem of whether, of how quickly we're able to respond to these folks. Also, one thing I'll say is I know people are concerned. They'll say, geez, I made my loans. You know, I, I, I worked hard. I made my payments. Why should my neighbor get a break uh, when they bought more than they can afford? You know, the moral hazard argument. And, and, and I understand that concern, and, and, and we don't want to incentivize that kind of behavior too much. 
On the other hand, if there are a number of people in your neighborhood who are going into foreclosure, that's going to affect your property value. And, and I would say that, you know, it's in your self-interest sometimes, maybe, to help somebody you might not really want to help, only because you stand to gain as well. One thing I didn't hear mentioned was education. Uh, my experience is that the general public, and this applies to people from the very low income groups through the high income groups, do not understand finance. They're not taught in school of what a mortgage is. They don't understand interest rates, none of this. And this is a prime problem that we have in this culture. Education is clearly part of this solution. And, and, and I agree with you, education includes you know, going to the high schools to begin teaching kids about finance, certainly teaching them through college and providing as much counseling as we can. There are lots of housing counseling groups out there. Part of the problem is a lot of them are fraudulent, and so the, the key is to steer people to legitimate counseling agencies. Um, but my only concern there is, is that for, for years, and I think to this day, the, the financial service industry basically says the solution to this problem is education and market forces. And I guess I didn't emphasize education as much because I think there's so much more than just education that needs to be part of this package. And, and I'm not persuaded that just educating people and then letting market forces do their thing is going to result in, in much less of, of a problem here. I mean, Alan Greenspan admitted that he was surprised that you know, people didn't pay attention to market signals. He always thought it would work, and, and apparently it, it didn't. So I guess I'm saying two things. I do think education is important for the reasons you mentioned, but I think we need to be careful that we don't think of education as, as the magic bullet or even as the predominant solution. To... I agree. It is. It, it is, and there are lots of good organizations out there that have long been providing uh, counseling and helping low-income families secure mortgages from institutions that are often willing to work with low-income people. Uh, so there is some help out there, but, but right now I think the number of people who are in trouble probably is far greater than the available help is to, to, to help them. We have time for one more question right there. I was just curious, you mentioned diverse urban communities. Where in the United States do you think there is a model for that, and why have they, how have they been successful? Well, I'll, I'll throw out a few things, in a, and I'll deny having said them, if, if forced. I mean, there are communities like Oak Park, Illinois, that's sort of recognized as being one of the pioneers of, in taking a number of steps involving both public and private collaboration. To, pr to create and preserve a stable, integrated community there. Shaker Heights, Ohio, where I grew up, uh, West Mount Airy in Philadelphia, and there are many neighborhoods around the country where we see some signs of s some communities that are stable and integrated. There are very few. It's a minority of the population that lives in these communities, but they don't happen by accident. I mean, for example, in Oak Park, they took a number of steps. They, they, got, they, they worked with local lenders and real estate agents who agreed to stop racial steering and, in fact, agreed to start showing whites in parts of Oak Park that were integrated and showing minorities and encouraging minorities to think about the white neighborhoods there. They, they developed a very rigorous building inspection plan so that if you bought a home anywhere in Oak Park, you knew you were getting a solid home or you knew exactly what was wrong with it. Uh, they, they banned for sale signs so that you wouldn't see evidence of panic peddling if three or four signs went up in, in a community. So there's lots of things that these communities have done. It, 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 it doesn't happen just by accident because there's so many forces that nurture racial turnover. 